Hi, I'm Anna, a grad student at McMaster University working on my thesis. Can I tell you a little secret? Last year I would really wanted to go away on vacation, but I just couldn't land a good deal in Cuba. So instead, I signed up for the three minute thesis competition. And now I'm so glad that I did. It changed my approach to science and to communicating my research to people. My parents can finally understand what I do here every day. This is what the three minute thesis competition is all about, sharing our research. So I encourage you to come out and be in the know. I'd love to see you there. So that was Anna Kovacevic. Um, I did a workshop with her a couple of years ago and, uh, and the, the video of that is online. You'll see some overlap, but she has, she, she has a lot of coverage in, in, in that particular video herself. And I think you might be quite interested in, in, in that. In fact, a, an awful lot of things went wrong. The equipment failed, all kinds of stuff failed. Uh, and all of that was edited out of the video. It's amazing what you can what you can hide from uh, uh, posterity if you, if you really want to. Okay, you're all here for three minute thesis. Uh, is that true? Anybody here not interested in the three minute thesis but has come for, to, under, to, to, to hear about presentations in general? Okay, so you're all somehow interested in three minute thesis competition. Okay, flattery and praise are as lethal as sugar. Now that is a quotation from a book. Again, this is another way of citing um, a reference. Uh, there are many ways of, of doing citations and you can see a number of them on this particular slide. It's a nice book actually. You can, uh, it's a very, very readable book. Uh, flattery and praise. Anyone that you rehearse with or reads your script or looks at your slide and says, yeah, that's great, that's, that's wonderful. That's, you know, and it, it might be a friend who doesn't want to hurt your feelings. It could be someone who uh, is act even trying to sabotage you by not challenging you to do better. So I would take this uh, seriously. And flattery, by the way, comes in many different forms. It can also come in the inflation of marks in an exam, which of course, sadly, uh, is rather prevalent if you listen to uh, professors, teachers speaking privately. Thus, Beware of experts, teachers, gurus, and peers like, like us here who cheat you with false praise. I will never cheat you with false praise. At least I'll try not to. I, will, uh, I might be a little bit hard on you if I see a slide or a script, but uh, just take it to the edge, right, Michelle? <laughs> take a little bit to the edge. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Okay. Another interesting uh, book that you might like to take a look at, uh, Chris Anderson, who owns the TED organization, wrote this book on TED Talks, um, Guide to Public Speaking. Now, there are lots of differences between Three Minute Thesis and TED. I mean, there really are differences, so don't, in, in, in TED, there are, there are all kinds of, uh, you, you can have all kinds of uh, images and, and, and videos and all kinds of other stuff which in a three minute thesis is not allowed. You're only allowed one static slide. So th there are differences. Uh, but that's a very readable book that uh, you would uh, be encouraged to, to take a look at. And this is a video that I'd like to play for you. For the first time in history, older people outnumber the younger. This has created unique health challenges. The scariest, dementia, a debilitating condition that erases memories. What's worse, there is no cure. This is why my research on interventions to prevent dementia is so vital. My name is Jennifer Heiss. I direct a team of researchers in the NeuroFit Lab where we've shown that physical inactivity contributes to dementia risk as much as genetics. I'm also Associate Director of the Physical Activity Center of Excellence, a platform for communicating our results to seniors. Our next step, to understand how exercise alters the brain. Then, within five years, I'm confident we can personalize exercise prescriptions to keep our ever-growing number of seniors healthier, longer. Now, I worked with her. This is a, obviously done specifically for a video. and It was a com competitive video. Um, I worked with her. You notice those gestures? Notice that she was standing in one spot, which was really rather convenient for the videographer. 
however, the word gestures, and notice, if you recall, if you go and look at that video, it's on my YouTube channel, that particular video, she gestured with her left hand, um, and you will notice where we're standing, I, again, I'll come back to that later on, I will tend to be gesturing at the slide with my left hand, so I'm standing stage right of this, the center stage is over here, and uh, I'm standing stage right, he's stage right, Michelle over there is now stage left, uh, right from your perspective, and I, I sort of maintain that this area, this area of the stage is the more authoritative stage, and I'll try to illustrate that a little bit later on. Again, he, coming back to Chris Anderson of the TED organization, notice uh, what he says in that book. Bullets belong in the Godfather, avoid them at all costs. That is a categorical statement in his book. Don't use bullets, okay? But he used bullets in his book to emphasize this point. So some, something went wrong in the editing process. Clearly, I'm sure that was unintentional. So what I'm saying is, when you read that book, and also when you listen to us, we may be giving you advice that's wrong. It may be, in the, our intention may be good, but it may be wrong. So beware of this kind of contradiction or self-contradiction. Authentic, engaging, clear, your thesis in three short minutes. I'm John Bandler. I'm Daniel Tajik. And Michelle Ogrodnik, who does not have a microphone, so I will speak for her for the moment. Don't, you're too far away, Michelle. You should probably won, wander in this. Yeah, no, come over here, because you're sort of, you're, you'll be in, uh, in, the, uh, in the video. Say hi to the audience. Hello. Okay, that's good. Don't hold it too far away, because, and by the way, uh, these, these, um, these, these microphones are strictly for the camera. You, won't he you don't hear them over the uh, loudspeaker system. So hold it close. I'm holding it. Don't okay. Worry. I'm sure Greg really wants to hear me say this. Uh, there are lots of acknowledgments. Um, over the years, I've worked with a lot of different people. If I put everybody down that I've worked with, it would just be a forest of names. Um, but these people that you can see here are, are some of the people that I've worked with m most intensely or most recently, uh, including Erin Kiley, a mathematician at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in, in Massachusetts, um, who is a um, co-organizer of a three-minute thesis at an IEEE conference that we have now managed for this is our third year. Uh, we're, we're having another three-minute thesis competition in Boston this year. Our first one was in Honolulu, the next one in Philadelphia, and next year we're organizing a three-minute thesis competition in connection with this international IEEE conference in Boston. That's Erin Kiley. Our agenda. Well, uh, as we go through this, we'll address problems with technical presentations. We'll talk about some presentation do's and don'ts. We'll give you some examples. We're going to go through a particular case study and Daniel will take over to do the actual live discussion. We will have a one minute speech from Michelle that she did live last year in front of an audience like this. And, uh, but this year we will play it rather than uh, get her to do this. So we'll talk about a number of things like slide composition, formulation of titles, theatricality, and uh, hopefully a couple of people who are in the audience here now will come up at a convenient point and give us some uh, input uh, about their own experiences with Three Minute Thesis. Okay, what we're not covering is a whole list of things here, although a lot of what we will say may be uh, appropriate for what you see on this slide, like poster presentations, exhibitor presentations, and so on. Certainly trying to make technical presentations more, uh, more engaging, and thesis defenses, which typically are not engaging at all. A lot of what we say applies there, but we're not explicitly covering all the things that you see here. Business plans, written presentations, and so on. So we're not covering that. I'd like to play you another video as another way of introducing Michelle here. 
uh, a winning uh, social sciences, uh, humanities research council uh, competition, video competition uh, that I'd like you to watch. Uh, again, notice that it's a video. There are all kinds of things that are cut into that video, and she tends to be standing still in one location. But, but nevertheless, it's very engaging and uh, it, 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 it's relevant. I can't help it. I'm constantly thinking about checking my phone. Come on, you've been there. Imagine, struggling to focus, maybe even on this presentation, and a thought like checking your social media keeps stealing your attention. That's mind wandering. And if you find your mind wanders, you're definitely not the only one. In fact, university students can spend 30 to 40% of class time off task, seriously impairing their learning. Clearly, we need some sort of strategy to help students stay on task. And our team's answer? Exercise. Exercise can sharpen your attention, improve your memory, and boost your capacity to learn. In McMaster University's NeuroFit Lab, we're investigating how we can incorporate exercise breaks into a university classroom. Our preliminary findings show that students who take three five-minute exercise breaks during an online lecture are able to sustain their focus until the end. However, those who take computer game breaks or no breaks lose focus near the end. This increased focus for our exercisers translated to higher academic performance, both immediately after learning and two days later. Clearly, there's something special about exercise, but could it be the difference between a B and an A? Well, there's still work to be done. What our lab wants to know is one, how intense do these exercise breaks need to be to show academic improvement? Two, how many breaks are required to show a real learning benefit? And three, how does this translate to different learning environments? Answering these questions while incorporating student and teacher feedback will allow us to create refined, feasible exercise prescriptions for teachers, students, and universities. What I can tell you right now is this. In order to reduce the time spent distracted in class and improve academic success, students should sweat so they don't forget. That's great. So, Michelle, do you want to say a few words? Um about the differences between that experience and three minute thesis, for example? Sure, I think I would first like to recognize Paulina for doing the amazing job on that video. I could not have done that independently. Um, I think that it's quite a different experience to do a video compared to a three minute thesis. Uh, the difference between a live presentation and a video and kind of those expectations change. Um, though I think that the experiences that you get out of communicating your research in concise amounts of time, regardless of the platform that you do it, can help translate to then trying to pitch yourself later on. Okay. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I love about this is the sort of minimalist aspect. I like the plain Black, uh, the plain white background. Uh, I like the minimalist uh, effect, which uh, Paulina did a great job. Uh. And this all came out of doing 3MT. Like my first taste into a small kind of pitching competition was doing 3MT and then it evolved into this, um, which was a really cool opportunity. I ended up getting to speak in front of the governor general in like Rideau Hall for this. And it was like the fanciest event I've ever been to. Um, so if you, enjoy your experience in 3MT. It's not the only experience, but again, it's not the be all end all either. Great, okay, thank you, uh, Michelle. And uh, here's another video. This is the, the, what you see on the slide right now is, uh, and I'm not gonna play this, but you, you're obviously welcome to go and take a look at last year's video that um, I did with Daniel and uh, Michelle. Okay, how to make your audience want less. Of course, you are our audience. Typical technical slides, and you've seen those things. They're crammed with text, crammed with images. The t tables tend to be dense, lengthy equations. 
detailed flow diagrams, in-your-face logos. I wish people would abandon logos completely. Sometimes logos take up a huge amount of real, real estate. And when you see a logo constantly flash, now TV stations do this deliberately. They flash these things because they're trying to push things at you. But, but you know that you know they're pushing this at you. But then you, you know when a speaker does that in a technical conference or the conference is doing that, it, it's kind of wearing. And eventually, of course, you you try to ignore those logos. So uh, does anybody have any questions about this so far? What I mean? Now you can see that my lettering is quite large. It's easily visible from the back of the audience. If, 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 if text on a slide cannot be read at the back of the auditorium that you're going to present it in, it's too small. Okay, it's as simple as that. So if there are people sitting at the back of the auditorium, your, your expected auditorium, and the text is unreadable there, it's just simply too small. A typical oral delivery is usually ill-prepared. It tends to be rushed. The speaker seems kind of distant, remote, tends to run out of time. Now, it doesn't matter whether you give people three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or half an hour. They always hit the limit of time. It's very rare they'll go under. And this may be partially psychological. They don't want to stop too early because that might invite questions from the audience. So they say, well, let, let, let me r go right up against the deadline and maybe I will not get any embarrassing questions. Now, in three-minute thesis, you're not going to get any questions. You do not want to hit the, the deadline. You do not want to get, go anywhere near three minutes. If for some reason you're slowing down, something distracts you, you forget something, you're going to go over three minutes, you will be disqualified. So you want to be well under three minutes. And of course, swallowing words. Uh, one of the most annoying uh, things that people tend to do, for re and even, even experts do, even very, very skilled, experienced people tend to do this. At some point, they throw in some kind of a, an aside or something they hadn't really properly prepared, and they somehow say it out quickly, swallow it, it, it disappears. And to me, it's annoying because I really want to know what a person said. So if we don't come through to you, do let us know. Tell us you can't hear us. Don't just tolerate it. Okay, first impressions. Are you aware of how you, of how you are perceived or received if people don't already know you? If the person that you're uh, with or addressing you, or address, you, you are addressing has never heard you speak before, if they've never heard of you before, if they've never seen you before, if you've sent them an email with an attachment with, you know, uh, indicated as doc, dot, doc x, or slide dot pptx, or cv dot doc, for argument's sake, I have a lot of these emails that come through to me from st students who are applying for graduate studies, for example. And what these people immediately tell me is that they cannot look at things from the reader's point of view. Because if I, if I am going to put that into one of my directories, I'm going to have to rename it myself. I'm going to have to put that person's name on it. So beware of the, beware of the impression you create with this. If you don't look at them in the eye, again, I apologize for my sunglasses. I've had eye surgery uh, last week. Um, partly a reason for when, why we're having it on this particular day. So I'm a little sensitive to light, but uh, I'm looking at you in the eye, so you can assume my eyes are still here. If you're underdressed and if you overload or cram your emails with, uh, with, with words, okay. How to want your audience, how do you, to make your audience want more? There are all kinds of uh, considerations. People's first impression of you. Some of you have never met us before. You've had certain first impressions. Now, these first impressions are going to tend to have a life of their own. They will tend to live with whatever impression that you have at the end of this presentation. A first impression is sometimes very difficult to shake. Um, things to consider, as I say, etiquette, articulation, your awareness of the audience. And then, uh, you know, citations, whether you have citations, 
um, the aesthetics of a particular slide. And of course, in your speech itself, does it follow a story uh, format? Uh, are you persuasive? Are you using uh, metaphors appropriately? What is your subtext? If any of you look at some of these words right now and you don't understand the meaning, by all means, ask a question. Does, does everybody understand what I mean perhaps by ethics? Let's, let's, let's talk about ethics. What might I be talking about in terms of ethics? Yeah, you have a... Oh, sorry. No, no, idea. Oh, no idea. Well, yeah. I beg your pardon? Citing your images. What's that? Citing your images. Oh, citing your images, yeah, for example. Citing your images. And of course, you know, not exaggerating. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a tendency, particularly when you're trying to address a general audience with technical work, uh, or you're trying to impress them, you may be over-exaggerating your results. You may be uh, interpreting things in a way that really is not scientifically appropriate. That's very easy to happen in a three-minute thesis competition. So 3MT, Michelle, uh, say a few words sure. about 3MT. First off, I want to pull first, can everyone hear me? Even you in the back, Rach? Okay. Um, who here knows the rules about 3MT? I mean, there's a couple of vets in the audience, so for the most part. So there's, so there's some kind of conversations. Um, but to clarify, so that's this three minute or less, very critical. Um, if you go over three minutes, situation, but if you stay under, we're all good, um, where you'll have one static PowerPoint slide to deliver this oral presentation. Um, what's nice about the three minute thesis is that I think it gives you this opportunity to present years, months, sleepless nights of your hard work that you've put in, whether it be business, social science, science, whoever it may be, this idea of pitching yourself is something that's pretty important nowadays, I think. And you get this, this opportunity to talk to people who you've never met, network. Uh, for me, it was the biggest thing for me was being able to convey to my family who don't necessarily always know why I'm a consistent student forever. Um, so it gives you this platform to kind of communicate your research. But for you, kind of these hard, soft, whatever skills you want to call them, is this idea that you're able to improve your communication skills, hopefully gain a little confidence in front of either a camera, an audience, whatever it may be, share your work, and as grad students, the cash isn't so bad either. Um, does anyone have any questions about the three-minute thesis? Anyone who has done it before want to share anything that I'm missing? How, how many of you are registering for this year's 3MT? Okay, good. Yeah, feel free to email me later on uh, after this uh, if, you have, if you want some help with scripts, slides, and so on. Is that okay, yeah, Michelle? I think as, long as, everyone, as long as everyone feels good about it, that's what matters, because it's important to know the rules and who you're, actually maybe we'll chat on, the, English is so hard. Perhaps we will chat about who your judges and your audience will be. Uh, the judges are going to be an intelligent group of people, but they might not necessarily all be academics. Um, and you'll be speaking to a room of, again, intelligent, but not specially specialized into your field. So it's important to acknowledge before you start any presentation, who you're gonna be chatting with. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea to take a look at who the judges are as soon as, you, as, soon as they're advertised. Okay, you have to cut the jargon. Um, to me, ideally, the three-minute thesis uh, should have ta a takeaway for anybody who walks into the room and listens to you speak. Liter and it doesn't have to be a university academic. Um, really, you should be able to communicate your work to anybody. Now, there are all kinds of technical words that are sometimes uh, uh, used, bandied around quite freely um, in general usage. You hear words like holography, polymer, DNA, amplifier, and so on. The, you know, a, a general audience will feel they have an idea of what that means because they've heard it in certain contexts before. But do remember those are still technical. Words like parameter, vector, model, iteration, communications, are highly misunderstood. Uh, depending upon which part of the university you come from, communications, for example, could mean something completely different. 
And then, of course, extreme jargon you see on the left there, words like phase shifter, isotropic, you absolutely have to avoid those. If you have to use a jargon word like that, it has to be used very sparingly, it has to be put into incredible well-chosen context and repeated a few times because people are not even going to catch what that word is. And there's a few more here. There, there, there are more, more recently people have, are talking about deep learning, AI, 5G, 5G networks, right? This is now kind of in the public domain. General audience may have heard of this, but it'll still be very confusing. Um, words like cardinality, even words like climate, are totally misunderstood. Donald Trump has no idea what the word climate means. He does not know the difference between weather and climate. So it goes right up to the top if you feel that he is at the top. Extreme jargon, of course, words like manifold, Bayesian, ex exponent, and so on. These words are taboo. Ensure your name ensure that you and your name are memorable. You want people to remember you. My name is. Now, what I'd like to do is have a couple of volunteers come up here. Some of you have done this before. Two volunteers who don't know each other, just please come up here. And what I want each of you to do in turn is to articulate your name to the other person. And I want the other person to write that down on the board having heard that name just once. Are there two brave volunteers? You're very close to the front, so you, you, are, you are harnessed as a volunteer if you... What's that? Very don't, hard. Don't, that, that's okay, that's great, why not? We'll, would you like to come forward? Yeah, why not? Or anybody else, if you... Why don't you, yeah, why don't you come forward and uh, come to the uh, board and... Uh, Do you want me to hold that for you as you stand up? That would be great, thank you. Yeah, why don't you do that? Don't feel shy. This is just, this can be fun. <laughs> so um, articulate, okay, so you articulate your name to her and she will take a piece of chalk and try to write it down. Phonetically or whatever, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, just say it once and loudly. <laughs> Craig's laughing because he Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. full name. First name, last name. It's up to you. It, what, how, how, so, oh, however you want to. first name. Okay, go ahead. Last name is 14 letters. Long, That's okay. So. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So do I say yeah, my yeah, name? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can say, say your name. My name is Swapna. Okay. Good. See if you can write that down. Good, excellent. Okay, that's very good. Thank you very much. Now the now the other way around. My R name is Sarah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, obviously, if we have last names, if we have more names, you can see what can happen. Um, and as I say, it really is critical that when you do any kind of presentation that you give people in the audience some kind of a clue as to what your name is or how you would like to be referred to. Um, you're they are more likely to talk to you if they remember your name. They're more likely to introduce you to somebody else if they can remember. Imagine them trying to introduce you and saying, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. You don't, that's a... Yes, by all. I would also like to make clear on that point, though, that you should not have to sacrifice how you pronounce your name for anyone else to be better able to understand it and know it. Making yourself memorable is the point, but I think that you pronouncing your name how it deserves to be pronounced and how it how you've identified is incredibly important. Right. Good. So there it is. That's what we just did. Can you write down a name that you heard only once? Um, Okay, now I'd we'd like to do a little exercise uh, on, on, on your laptop, phone, or piece of paper, or whatever. Write down the first line of your speech, and I'll ask a couple of people perhaps to read out those lines. Okay, are you ready? You have two minutes. Okay, okay, now you did hear some 
opening lines already in the videos, so uh, so you you should be should have been primed. So who who would like to volunteer? Um, maybe we should take the microphone there and yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, that's good. So uh, who would like to volunteer to read out that their first line? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, say it loudly. Imagine a perfect house on a perfect lawn in a perfect suburb somewhere in America in 1956. Wow, that's great. That's uh, excellent, yeah. That's, uh, that's good. Anyone else? One other person? That's a great opening. Anyone else? Shy? Okay. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay? What if you turned to someone close to you and shared your brainstorm, so that way everyone at least gets to say it to someone else? Take 30 seconds. Turn to someone near you and tell them what you wrote. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, I hope you've been able to share your uh, opening with somebody and maybe, maybe get a little bit of feedback. So let's go back to our... Uh, workshop. So a three minute thesis, no jargon, don't get stuck in details, use metaphors, include human stories, uh, your own story, a personal story, and in fact the, the opening that we heard uh, earlier uh, sounded to me like it was a human story. Um, now when you memorize something, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a tendency to lose authenticity, you may sound a little bit robotic. So the trick with memorization is to go way, f way further than being able to just repeat the script. You've got to go far beyond that to feel very comfortable with what you've written. If, you, if you're just on the edge of memorizing it, you'll be stopping and hesitating and looking up and searching for words. So you have to go far beyond that. And you must give the audience a tangible get takeaway. Um, somebody comes in and listens to you, then leaves, and someone else asks them, well, what did that last speaker just say? They have to be able to articulate something that they heard about your presentation. So a takeaway. So lots more things to consider. I would suggest 120 words per minute maximum. Don't go beyond that. Um, because you're, you're going to be crowding, uh, crowding the script with words. Start early on your slide. I, I recommend that people actually s create the slide before they start on their script because you want to embed your slide in your script. The slide is going to be there for three minutes. The audience need, will be looking at that for three minutes. So start early on that. Somehow indicate your qualifications, that you're a PhD student or th through the lab that you're working in, or somehow indicate that you are qualified to um, do that particular work. Consider a story format. If you start off with a hero and a story, the story has to end with that hero. If you're starting off with yourself at the beginning, it has to end with what happened to you. If you start off with a story about a, a, a relative of yours, something happened to a certain relative, it has to end on that. That's how we tell stories. Avoid generalities. Be specific. You know, be concrete and be specific. Um, and rehearse with people who haven't heard you speak before. The easiest trap to fall into is to speak to someone who's heard you and knows you and knows all your strange ways of articulating things and they say, yeah, this is all great, this is fine. But a stranger may have no idea what you're saying. Don't be satisfied with kindness. Don't, like, don't look like you're reading a script. Uh, in a very, at a very early stage in the process, you know, you sometimes see people's eyes going back and forth like this as if they're trying to recall the script that they wrote. Articulate every single word clearly. If, it, if a word is important, articulate it clearly, including your name. Don't swallow your name. If your name is in some way complex, then stop after you say it, let it sink in, and then continue. Pause. The floor is yours. So if I pause now, if I stop for 5, 10, 15 seconds, first of all, you're going to wonder, you're going to wonder why I stopped. In fact, it may even attract your attention. You may start looking up. Why did he stop speaking? So if I pause uh, in, a, in a speech like this, I have to be able to deliver some kind of a punchline that makes that pause worthwhile. You won't be interrupted in the speech, so you don't have to sort of keep talking without, a, without any pause. 
be in the moment. So if you're really in that moment, if you really, if you're really, uh, you really understand what you're saying as you say it, rather than just simply repeating something you've memorized, then if something goes wrong, you can just keep on going and, and the audience will have no clue that you've missed something or you've said something differently. Be kind to the judges, they'll thank you. The judge, remember, be, these judges will be, have been listening to many, many other presentations. Be kind to them, don't overload them, and they'll thank you for it. So we're going to do a case study now, um, and uh, Daniel will take over momentarily. In this case study, look for metaphor, look for believability, look for purpose, purposeful gestures, you know, a purposeful gesture. Um, uh, is it relatable? Is there humor in it? Is there some kind of a storyline? Is it, is, it, is it somehow related to a, a particular person or a relative or someone close to the speaker? And what is the audience takeaway? So with that, I'd like to turn this uh, floor over to Daniel. Perfect. And uh, you should operate this too. Awesome, thank you. And uh, go ahead, Daniel. Okay, so I'll just slide over here, Dr. Renler. Perfect. Um, so today we're going to be looking at a presentation by uh, Kanchu Sang. She was in a competition last year in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department, and she did very well. And you're going to see a lot of the stuff that Dr. Bandler talked about just now uh, uh, really shown well in this presentation. So I'm just going to show you the title of her presentation here, Brainwave Analysis for Stroke Detection. And just take a look at her slide here. I'll let you take that in. Uh, it's a little washed out because of the color. Um, it's a crumpled piece of paper with a, with a flat, uncrumpled piece of paper next to it. Now let's watch the presentation here. Have you, your relatives, your friends ever suffered from a stroke? A stroke could happen to you at any time. You may even be completely unaware of it. Late diagnosis could result in permanent disability or even death. My name is Tan Xiu. I want to detect this condition earlier and prevent these tragedies from occurring. Let me tell you about the brain. Brain cell activity generate brain waves they reveal information about this activity, like billions of radio stations transmitting data every single second. This information can include abnormal cerebral blood flow, which is a sign of brain stroke. This information is key, but challenging to extract from the massive amount of data. My research is to find the brainwave information most relative to the brain strokes and detect it in a quick and easy way. I calculated a list of numbers, each number representing how brain activity changes in the different locations of the brain at different times. However, these numbers are encrypted in a higher dimensional space. It's like trying to read a message on a crumpled paper ball. So how would you read this information? By unfolding the piece of paper, of course. This is exactly what I did mathematically. After I unfolded the special higher dimensional space of the numbers I calculated, the difference between brain waves from a normal person compared to a person who had a stroke became clear and detectable. My method was able to detect a stroke with 92% accuracy within 30 seconds. Now I'm working on the next step. After unfolding, stretching the space to make that difference even clearer for detection. In the future, a stroke still could happen to you at any time. But this time, you will be aware of it. Your loved ones, your family members, can help you better. Thank you. All right, so that was a very good presentation. What was that opening line in her presentation? Kanchu's hook was, have you, your relatives, 
your friends ever suffered from a stroke? It's a powerful opener, right? And she uses a lot of pauses here to emphasize these words and build this drama of what she's going to present throughout her presentation. The nice thing I like about her hook is that it doesn't correlate well with her slide. Right? So her opening sequence is this powerful statement with a slide that has some crumpled pieces of paper. And I think what this hook does is, yes, it opens something very powerful, but also sparks curiosity in the audience. Because you want to know how exactly she's going to talk about this slide with her presentation. And you'll see as, uh, as we go on through this presentation how she ties it in. You notice throughout this presentation, she's making a lot of hand gestures. Right? Whenever she's talking about her brain, she's pointing towards her head. When she's talking about brain waves, she's making this wave motion. Tying in gestures to your presentation uh, makes it so that you don't have your arms hanging by your sides, sort of lifeless, and also uh, helps uh, really explain better what you're talking about. It makes it more relatable. This entire opening segment has a lot of dramatic fragments where she tries to emphasize what she's saying with a lot of pauses. And she repeats this throughout her presentation, right? At different situations where she's going to try and emphasize what she's trying to get the audience to understand or try to increase the drama of what she's saying. There's her hook, right? And as Dr. Bandler was saying earlier, she started building a story here by asking this question to the audience. The pointer doesn't work. <laughs> Have you ever suffered, suffered from a stroke? and the pauses. And pauses are key throughout your presentation. You do not want to eat all of your words as you're speaking. Try to include as many pauses as possible and your judges will appreciate it greatly. If you just rush through the presentation and try and squeeze as much information in three minutes as possible, you will not do well, I promise you. You have to make the pauses work for you. The pause is like a word or a long word, two or three words. They are as effective as words. Yeah, absolutely. So you see, she's trying to directly relate with the audience here, right? She's making this very personal. She talks about you getting a stroke, right? And uh, keeping the audience tied together with your presentation helps keep them motivated to listen through the entire presentation as well. This drama here, talking about death, really increases uh, the impact of what she's going to talk about later. And so the audience is thinking now, this is something that's very important to me. How are you going to solve it? And that is where she introduces herself and introduces what she wants to do, right? And you notice here that she states her name. My name is Kanchu. I recommend that you do this as well, as Dr. Bandler, Bandler mentioned earlier. Uh, some people can mess up your name even if it's very simple. My name is Daniel, and I've been called Danielle in introductions uh, more frequently than I would have liked, right? So getting this opportunity to correct uh, your name is very important. And it lets people know who you are, right? And here she introduces what she wants to do. What she wants to do is prevent these tragedies. So the next thing, she's told you what she wants to do. Now you're asking, how is she going to do this? And that's where she introduces this uh, sort of overview of what's going on with her story of what the brain is doing. So she tells you this story. And again, she's using a lot of hand gestures, uh, big wave-like motions when she's talking about brain waves. Uh, when she's talking about billions of radio stations, she makes this really wide gesture. Uh, this is, uh, it feels a little bit strange when you're making these wide gestures, but it looks very natural to the audience. So when you're practicing this, try to over-exaggerate your gestures, and it'll look natural to someone who's watching. As I said, gestures and analogies. And you notice that when she's explaining all these things, this is a very complex mathematical procedure, right? But all these metaphors are very simple to understand. And I think that's one of the tricks when you have a, a very mathematical, very uh, technical uh, topic that you're studying. Uh, to find these metaphors is really challenging. You have to spend some time doing it. Uh, but Kanchu did a great job really explaining uh, the process of which she extracts this data and transforms it into detecting strokes. So here again, you notice that she uses pauses and uh, dramatic fragments, right? Here she's trying to emphasize this abnormal cerebral blood flow, enhancing what uh, you're already feeling concerned about, which is a stroke. She repeats this word of a stroke, brain stroke. And your audience is going to only hear this once, so don't be afraid to repeat, repeat certain phrases or words to ensure that they've caught what you're trying to say. 
And then she continues to use more gestures. She never stops. She's also moving around the stage uh, very enthusiastically, right? And it doesn't feel at all unnatural. Sometimes it's a little bit strange. You know, if you stand here stoic and don't move, it doesn't really connect you with the audience. But if you're walking back and forth at a regular pace and, uh, in fact, stepping forward or stepping back at key moments, it can really enhance the impact of what you're saying. Now she's, she's talked about what she wants to do. She states how she wants to do it, right? She wants to find where, when these strokes are happening quickly and effectively. And so this is where she goes into the mathematics of her problem. And you note here there's no jargon. The, the only complicated phrase that she uses is this concept of a higher dimensional space, which she immediately explains through her slide, right? So totally avoids, uh, avoids jargon in this presentation. And she continues to tell her story and talks about this slide and connects directly with their slide. And I think this is really key. So this whole time you've had this slide and you don't quite understand what it means, she finally answers this curiosity, this question that you've had in your head by talking about the slide. And I think it's very valuable and powerful to use your slide as a component of your presentation and not as a summary, all right? Summaries, uh, they're great, but they don't have any impact towards the judges and your audience. When you make them think a little bit more and use something very simple, uh, you can spark that curiosity, which really enhances the overall presentation. And uh, yeah, throughout this whole presentation, she's keeping it relatable and engaging with her slide. As Dr. Bandler mentioned, when you're engaging with your slide, it's usually helpful to point towards it, uh, extend your arm out. Don't extend your right arm so that you're blocking your body. Uh, whatever arm that exposes your body and, uh, and helps you connect with the slide. So again, continuing to explain and engage, uh, very easy to understand metaphors throughout this presentation. And the story is very simple, right? She explains that she can take this crumpled piece of paper, stretch it out, and from that she can extract what she needs to solve her problem of how do we deal with brain strokes. And she states, or concludes this with this final bottom line, right? She's able to detect a stroke with 92% accuracy within 30 seconds. Now, one thing I want to say is that you should be cautious with using numbers in your presentation because numbers can be relative to your field. And though they, to you, may appear to have significant impact, uh, it may not appear that way to the rest of your audience. Uh, if you take, for example, let's say I build some sort of electrical circuit component and it's 17% more efficient than any other component on the market. That 17% may be very valuable to me, but your audience can't really comprehend that other than 17% seems sort of small. So avoid those uh, very specific mathematical numbers unless they're very easy to grasp and understand. And here, 92% accuracy, it's, uh, it's an easy number for all of us to understand and uh, appreciate. Now, once she's done that and said what she's able, been able to do with her research, she moves on and talks about what she wants to do in the next step in the future work. And again, this just shows that she's emphatic about what she's doing and she wants to continue pursuing this in the long run. So she's sharing her vision of the future, what she wants to do. And all of the time throughout this entire presentation, it's very relatable. Uh, and she constantly mentions the audience, you, your family, your loved ones. And throughout the entire presentation as well, she's looking into the eyes of the people she's speaking to, okay? So it's a little bit tricky to make sure you have the right amount of time when you're making eye, co eye contact with someone. Uh, you don't want to dart around too fast because it looks a little bit crazy, and you don't want to stare at someone for a very long period of time so they get uncomfortable. Uh, but you find that balance with a couple of seconds of eye contact between different individuals, and it looks natural to the rest of the audience and the person you're looking at. And it's also very helpful with the judges as well. If the judges are sitting in the front row, do your best to try and make eye contact with each one of them because it'll make them feel more connected to the presentation you're giving. You notice that she comes back to this conclusion here uh, and she's repeating that initial statement, right? She's talking about you, your loved ones, your family members, and how she's going to make them better. So she bookends her presentation with the exact same uh, opening line that she had at the beginning of her presentation. It's just a really nice way to conclude a presentation in this sort of storytelling mode of a presentation. And then finally, she's very respectful, bows, and says thank you, which I think everyone should, everyone should really do. 
And so that, that's the end of Cantu's presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions about any specifics of this presentation or anything you saw during her presentation? She won uh, second place in the competition. Yes, yes. she came da in second place. Daniel, Daniel won the competition. Yes. And the, the competition was actually held in here. And it was the first Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering 3MT competition. So uh, we're very happy about that. Yeah, and I think all the presentations yeah. are online as well. Yeah. So if you want to take a look at those presentations, yeah, a, yeah. you can give out the link. There's a playlist. I'll come mm -hmm. to that later Perfect. on. Yeah. Perfect. Good. OK. OK. Oh, no more. Yeah. yeah. So, how there, there's clearly so much organizational planning that goes into crafting something like that. Mm -hmm. So, how long did that take her? And okay. Uh, good. That's a great, great question. Great question. I, I, I worked with her over a period of days. Yeah. We ha have to repeat the question. Let me repeat the question. Yeah, sure. The question is, how long did it take her to put that all together? script, slide, rehearse, and so on. Yeah, it, it was a long time. Uh, she worked really intensively. Um, initially, she didn't quite get what this was all about. She had problems with articulation. Remember, we had a rehearsal. Uh, Dan was in on that rehearsal. It was sort of touch and go whether it would come together or not. And that was uh, several days before the competition. But then after pointing out a few things that could be easily improved. She finally got the idea, and then she practiced relentlessly. I think she must have done this thing 24 hours a day for the next few days. She was actually in here before the competition began and was pacing around before the judges turned up, and she was still rehearsing before the competition began. So it was very intense. Can I make a comment on that? Yeah. I think that it's very important to recognize you, you'll put in, hopefully, what you put in, you'll get out, but also you're a human being. Like, 24 hours a day of repeating your 3MT script uh, is probably not super healthy. So, um, in my experience, giving yourself as much time as you need in terms of how comfortable you are as a presenter, I think matters. I know that's kind of a wishy-washy answer. Um, but if you are someone who feels really, really nervous in front of a crowd, um, Perhaps practicing a little bit more might be more beneficial, but if you're someone who feels relatively more comfortable, perhaps you don't need that 24 hours a day. So um, in my case, I don't know how long you prepared for. I wish I prepared a little bit more, um, but I would say I started seriously working on practicing and rehearsing like two and a half weeks in advance. Um, definitely not 24 hours a day. Um, I think my script was okay. I wish I had spent more time on my slide in advance, but that, that was my timeline. I don't know if yeah. you want to share yours. So I think for me, it took me about a month on and off, not, not constantly writing, but over that period of a month, uh, throwing words on a page and then editing it overall. And then leading up to the presentation, I was practicing uh, at least a couple times a day, um, but it's three minutes, right? So it's not, like, it's not an exhaustive thing to practice. Um, I think the key thing is finding, uh, you, get, you get more value out of your practice if you find people who haven't seen you talk ever before and have them uh, criticize you for what you're speaking or for what you're saying rather. So uh, overall timelines, yeah. But it can vary between people. It doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, one month lead time or whatever it is. Yeah, let me just follow up on that. Daniel won this won a competition twice. He, uh, he won first place and uh, audience choice at this IEEE conference in 2017 in Honolulu. He then repeated, and there's a video of that online that you can find his, his first speech. And then he repeated that last year in the department competition and won again. So he won, so his speech is really good. Mm -hmm. So he knows what he's talking about when he make, makes those comments. But if we're going to talk about Daniel's speech for a second. Yeah. I'm going to call you the blueberry man for a second. Going back to this idea of being memorable and having someone remember your name, um, I think in this conversation we've been kind of interchanging simple with Western, but I think that what's more important than almost your, like having your name fully memorable, like Daniel, I will never forget, he has this amazing talk about a blueberry. He's an engineer and there's a blueberry. And so forever he was the blueberry man for me. Like, 
it was so, so, so memorable. And so yes, your name is important, but if you can tie something that really captures the audience in a different way, I think that's also okay. Yeah. So that should give you uh, some curiosity to go and check Daniel's video. We're not playing it this year. We did, we did that last year. Okay, so um, I'd like to turn over, go over to Michelle Grodnick's one minute speech that she actually memorized and presented live here a year ago, but uh, we have a video of it, so we'll play that and then Michelle can say a few words about it. Hi, I'm Michelle Grodnick and I'm a mind wanderer. Come on, we've all been there trying to focus on a presentation, but instead thinking about that oh so delicious donut you're gonna eat next. In fact, university students can spend almost half their time off task. But our research shows that short exercise breaks during learning can dramatically reduce mind wandering compared to computer game breaks or no breaks. Importantly, those who completed exercise breaks in the study immediately had higher quiz scores right after learning and two days later. On McMaster's grading scale, this might be the difference between a B and an A. So with the goal of creating refined, feasible exercise prescriptions for students and teachers, one thing seems certain. Students need to sweat so they don't forget. Thank you. 52 seconds. Um, I think I was uh, thinking back to this, I actually like, blacked out at one point during this presentation, like this one minute, I just like totally forgot what was going on. It had been a long day, but it speaks to this idea that uh, once you get so comfortable with your script that you're able to just kind of figure out what you're gonna say on the fly, you can survive those moments. Um, and I like this example as well, because often people are worried about this idea of three minutes, oh my gosh, how am I gonna communicate all of this hard work? I challenge you and I'm certain that each and every one of you could do it in one. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd just say like the once you've practiced enough, you, you can save yourself from those those falls. I know in my Honolulu presentation I made a mistake towards the end. Um, but because I'd practiced it so much, I was able to pick it up without anyone actually noticing significantly that I'd done anything wrong. So. Yeah, if you if you watched uh, Daniel's video from Honolulu, you see he slipped up at one point. But I think he was so engaging that uh, in, in, a, in, in real time, the audience and the judges would have just missed it. It's visible on a video, but I think would have been completely missed in the, in the live presentation. Yeah. Yeah, it's just something. Videos don't really do justice to what the three-minute thesis presentation ends up being. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you're going to talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between looking at a video and the live presentation. Yeah. Can I have the... Uh, yes. click? Thanks. Okay, slides. <coughs> keep, keep your slides simple. I'll show you a few slides uh, that I think are really, really simple, straightforward, engaging. I, I think if you look at this particular slide and you look at the title, of course, this in a sense is a summary of the entire presentation, um, but it's still captivating. What, what will the speaker talk about? How, what what, will, what he, will he or she uh, address? This one again is kind of captivating, sniffing out weapons with microwaves. Um, weapons, microwaves, you see somebody walking through a corridor hauling a, a suitcase. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be dramatic. You don't have to show real weapons. You can make it mysterious. You, could, you, you don't have to alarm the audience. But something really simple like this is, uh, I think, uh, works very effectively. Now, what about titles? Uh, keep them catchy but meaningful. Make them catchy but meaningful. Sweat so you don't forget. So would you like to say a word or two about sweating so you don't forget? Shout out to Kristen Lucibello who came up with that for me. Um, I think what I wanted to actually touch upon in the last one, something to keep in mind when you're making your slides or choosing your title or choosing your script, words, whatever you want, design it or think about it in a way that everyone can enjoy the experience. So John mentioned earlier, big, bold letters that everyone can read from all parts of the room. But even things like if you have some sort of comparative photo, avoid using red and green side by side because there's a ton of people who are uh, experienced colorblindness. So keeping accessibility at the forefront of your designs, I think is also challenging, but something to consider. Right. 
Good. So th there's a few other very engaging titles, uh, simple, catchy. Lead poisoning is everywhere is another one. Uh, Wing, the, the, the last one who did lead poisoning is everywhere. She's the winner of the three-minute thesis competition from 2017, uh, I should say. And uh, scientifically quantifying the craft of acting, Matthew Berry, he won the competition last year and, um, and the Ontario competition. So, uh, and he, I think he may be entering the competition this year as well. This may, uh, may worry you, but uh, anyway, he's, he's, he, he said he might do something different. So you are in your composition. Okay, we are actually part of this composition. Think of this stage as a, as a composition, like a work of art is a competition. So the, the, this is here for decoration, but you think of this as a composition. Well, so is this entire stage. I think of this whole thing. The slide is a composition in its own right, and then we as part of it. Uh, now, um, the, I maintain that the power authority position uh, is, is, is sort of emphasized when you have your friend on your right hand side and your enemy or the person you want to be you want to have some kind of power over or authority over on your left uh, if you watch tv you will notice for example uh, weather meteorologists weather forecasters almost always at least the ones that i've watched almost always stand on this side of the uh, of the uh, weather map and I always, I always think about that is they, to me, it signifies they don't want to be in control of the weather. The weather should be in control of them. They cannot control the weather. So to me, there's a subtext there. There's a, something, an underlying. I don't know if they actually think that way. I, you very rarely see them on this side. Um, it's, it comes from the idea of a right-hand man being your friend. And here are some examples. TV talking heads is a perfect example. Alison Camerata, who's on the left side from your point of view, and Kellyanne Conway, um, the uh, henchwoman, I guess, of Donald Trump, one of Donald Trump's uh, hench people, hench persons. Uh, she's the, uh, Alison, who's on this, on my side of the screen, is the host. And I would say that she clearly is antagonistic or opposes the views of the guest uh, Kellyanne Conway. And that arrangement makes the host have authority over, which is reasonable actually, it's reasonable for the host of a show to exercise authority over their guest because they want to be in control. But there's more subtext. And here's another example. Again, Alison Camerata and uh, 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 her guest. Again, she's in the same position. Now here's an in here she is again. Now here I maintain that Chris Cuomo, who's on the right-hand side from your point of view, he is a really, he's tall, he's big, he's loud, he is, you know, very emphatic. So why is she on this side? Because that, I maintain that they put her there to kind of elevate her a little bit, to give her more authority in that. If, they, if, if she was on the other side, I think he would just be so, look so overbearing, he would sort of diminish her. That's my psychology, psychological analysis. Uh, host one and host two. Now, Chris Cuomo went to the evening and was replaced by John Berman. Now, notice that John Berman is on the left-hand side. So how does all of this fit in with my argument? Well, uh, Allison, by that time, by the time that Berman came along, was already a veteran of the show. She was already the authority figure. Berman was the new guy on the block. So you want to give the new guy on the block a little bit of, give him a little boost of authority, you put him on that side. And actually, he still remains on that side to this day. They haven't moved him. And again, a power position, top left-hand corner uh, is, again, the hosts and uh, various talking heads in the other corner. So it gives you an idea of where the authority position is. And I maintain that if you're standing on this side of your slide, if you can, you exercise authority. If you're walking around on the stage and move to the other side and gesture with this hand, you're sort of giving, you're handing authority to your slide. Your, your, your slide is a character in your story. So if the screen is center stage, you know, stand stage right. This is stage right, 
left from your point of view, and in front of all barriers. We're, not, we're trying not to hide behind a barrier. It shows that we have nothing to hide. If, you, if you're over here, you have something to hide, or you're just reading from a script. Your optimal actions walk towards the audience, engage through open arms, outstretched, and ask the audience questions. Now, you're not supposed to engage in a dialogue in a three-minute thesis, but you can certainly ask rhetorical questions, and you can look at someone and ask a rhetorical question. Okay, uh, 3MT recollections, experiences, and comments. We have a couple of uh, veterans of three-minute thesis, uh, Madeline Simpson from Chemical Engineering. Madeline, would you like to come and use the microphone and say a few words about your three-minute thesis? Uh, Experiences? Okay. Whatever comes into your head. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Madeline. I'm doing my PhD in chemical engineering. Um, my first experience in 3MT was competing in my department's uh, competition last year. So, it was a setting I was pretty familiar with and comfortable with. I was in my fourth year of grad school at that time, so I knew pretty much everyone in the audience. Um, I also had the advantage of knowing a couple of judges just by good fortune. So it was definitely an atmosphere that I was very comfortable in. Um, but I can tell you that the process leading up to it was a very big learning curve. Um, I've been to a ton of conferences and I've written plenty of abstracts and I kind of sat down with that idea of like making something technical. Um, and basically, probably the first three or four versions of what I put together was not what I actually ended up coming up and presenting. Um, I was basically like a word vomit of everything from what I cared about, what I kind of say when I do my spiel, which I'm sure you all have at this point when it comes to doing your research, but it wasn't really um, a story that I wanted to tell. So when I started to work with John, he really encouraged me to kind of come together and think of it, about it from more of a different perspective. And I'm really lucky because I am in engineering. I do have a very set application. So I work on drug delivery to the brain. So I have a very clear target, a very clear population that I want to help and that I would also be interacting with. So I kind of tried to develop my um, three-minute thesis from there in terms of who would I want to appeal to. And and you know, you have your clinicians that you would maybe want to give this to. You have the individuals or the patients that this is actually relevant to. So you can think of it on kind of different levels. It's definitely an emotional thing um, because my specific project is dealing with antipsychotic drugs, so people with different mental disorders. Um, and then also like a very pragmatic uh, side. So what's the logical explanation? Why would a clinician want to give this to someone? And then also from an economical side, we have treatment options. So why is this better? What is the difference? So I think if you can kind of come together and think of it from all the viewpoints of maybe who you would not necessarily pitch to, but who would be affected by what you're doing, it kind of helps you bring your story together a little bit more conclusively. And then you can start to play around. John is a really big fan of a metaphor. So how can you help people in the audience kind of see your research? Everything I make is teeny tiny, you know? You can't actually visualize it. There's no way of doing that. So in order to put a picture up on a slide, it would be a microscopy image, which isn't overly appealing, or at least not the way my stuff comes out. Some of you probably have beautiful images from microscopes. It just doesn't work that way for mine. So you have to find a way that people can relate and it can be really challenging. I was in a room of chemical engineers who kind of all shared the same field, but for this competition, it's a lot more of a broader spectrum. So trying to figure out how people from different backgrounds might also relate, um, I think is a bit more of a challenge that you have to face. Yeah, thanks Madeline, great, thank you. Suera, so would, would you like to come up? This is Suera so Oways, who is, um, in the uh, PhD MD neuroscience program uh, and also has a show on CFMU. So you may, you may find someone. Yes, I'm Let's always see. looking for people to come on <laughs> CFMU, the Alma Mac, Thursdays 12 to 1230. Um, but not talking about the radio show. So I've also had uh, the good fortune of being both a contestant and a judge for McMaster's 3MT and I was a judge for the ECE heats. Um, and there's two things that I think I did not appreciate until I was a judge. So the first thing was the importance of crafting a story. So you want to walk your audience through a beginning, middle, and end and put 
road markers for them to follow, so have nice transition statements. And to supplement that, that's the second thing, the importance of nonverbal communication. So these are things that um, these three individuals have already talked about, but I really did not appreciate significant gestures until I was a judge. Because of course words are important, but when you inundate them and pair them with significant gestures, it makes that story so much easier to follow. And you only have three minutes to make such an engaging and impactful story. So um, try to do it through both those avenues. Uh, those are just a couple of reflections that I Good. Have. That's great. Thanks so much. It's wonderful. Wonderful. So coming back to Three Minute Thesis, when you, 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 will, be, you will be watching video. We watch some videos here. Now remember, when you're watching a video, the video has been edited. You're not seeing what the judges saw. The judges, if, let's say the competition is being held in this room, let's assume the contestants are all lined up over in these seats and the judges are over here. The judges may have already been looking at the contestants. They may already have formed opinions. Um, they may have formed an opinion when the contestant is putting on a mic, how that person behaves, how that person you know, interacts with other contestants then the contestant walks up and maybe waits his or her turn while the previous speaker finishes and then that then the contestant comes up here all of this stuff has been edited out of the videos that you've seen in general and you don't see what happens when the video ends you don't see the contestant going back the judges see all that so they have more information so when you wonder why did somebody win or why did somebody lose. Uh, it could be for reasons other than what you're seeing on the video. Is the slide visible and for how long? Some of the uh, three-minute thesis uh, videos um, have their slides missing. They're not, they're not there. You just, you just hear them. Sometimes the slide is there all the time. Sometimes the slide is intermittent. So your audience and your judges, they will also hear the host's introduction. Now, you may be introduced, your name may not come across properly, they'll see you stumble on the stage, they're already biased before you've even opened your mouth. They may ignore or dislike your slide. They, of course, absorb audience reaction. They may be sitting in amongst the audience and they get the mood of the audience. Uh, you don't see that so much in a video. And, of course, they'll also consider relative performance. You're looking at one video, you don't know what the relative performance is. So coming back to slides, I want to show uh, a few slides that are interesting. Anna Kovacevic's uh, slide, again, I mentioned uh, two years ago, I did a workshop here with Anna. Uh, this is her slide, that's her title, that's her name, and of course a, uh, a citation to the photographer uh, right there, uh, quite appropriate. Notice she has a couple of logos, I mean, whether you have them there or not is really up to you. You may think of it as a security blanket to have a logo, I don't know. Um, uh, sniffing out weapons with microwaves, again, we've already heard about that. Notice the, um, the title, the, uh, the, 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 the speaker's name, and the citation is, is there as well. Um, here are some uh, photographs that I took during uh, the Ontario competition. Tong Guo, with whom I worked a few years ago, he went on to the he won at McMaster, went on to Ontario. Notice how he is engaging with his slide. Notice his hand, notice his left hand engaging with the slide. And then with Anna, the slide was above her head, so she could have moved. She was mostly center stage, but of course she could have moved if she wanted to. In fact, the winner of that competition, the winner of that competition was all over the map. The videographer will usually put a, an X on the floor and says, stand here. But that's for the videographer's uh, uh, um, convenience. The judges don't care what you do, okay? So the guy who actually won that competition when Anna uh, competed, he was all over the stage. He was just practically in the lap of the, in the, uh, the judges. Again, notice all those hand gestures. You, you, you saw, can't you do some hand gestures? Uh, look at those gestures, very meaningful, but they look, they look really natural because he rehearsed so much, it became part of him. He, he, he uh, made it look natural. So before the presentation, choose words wisely, introduce redundancy. You need repetition. 
Introduce pauses. Pauses can be more important than the words. Sometimes a pause says, speaks volumes. If somebody asks you a question and your response is silence, that silence can say volumes. You don't have to respond. Uh, dress thoughtfully and respect those butterflies. If you don't have butterflies, you might be a psychopath. But uh, I, I, I usually have butterflies almost all the time. Now, some rehearsing tips. Buddy up with other contestants. One of the things that I noticed uh, in previous years, uh, time was not so critical, so I tended to work and rehearse with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, often for an hour at a time. But when we did the electrical and computer engineering department competition, time was at a premium. There was very little time. So I said, oh, I've just got to take two, three, four people at the same time. And the interesting thing is they, it all, they fed off each other. They, they, they heard the comments, and it actually works quite well. So, you know, you may be contestants, but working together just makes you both, or two of you, or three of you better. Practice with someone who's not heard you speak before. Practice with someone who's not heard you speak before. Practice with someone who's not ever heard you talk about a technical subject before. Do a real dress rehearsal. You don't want to look awkward in your clothes. You want to look natural. Better to look natural than to be, you know, dressed uh, for uh, the governor general's, uh, you know, better to look natural. I don't know, what did you, what did you wear when you went to the governor general's? Uh, I was wearing like this black pantsuit, but they had to like put a microphone on me. So it was a weird place to clip. So for those of you who might be wearing clothing that might be difficult to put a microphone to, just keep that in mind. So you did, you did, a re you repeated your presentation in Rideau Hall, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, and if I could add one more rehearsing tip, um, something that I found useful, because I get pretty nervous when I have to present, and my heart rate gets up. So what I do sometimes is a bunch of jumping jacks, and then I run through my presentation. And so, don't forget. exactly. But also, you ha it's nice to practice your presentation when your heart rate is up, because you will feel that when, I don't, yeah, as, as Dr. Bandler said, you have to be sort of a psychopath to not get any butterflies when you're doing that stuff. So just getting your heart rate up when you present, um, it can be helpful to sort of uh, familiarize yourself with the experience. Question? Right, yeah, so, yeah, as I'll just repeat it, uh, exhausting yourself um, so that you just know it, uh, you practice it so much that when you, even if you can't sleep, you've practiced it to the point where you, you can finally feel comfortable that you know that material because you've repeated it so much. And uh, there is definitely a point when you're rehearsing where you have this sort of mechanical understanding of it. You're sort of reading the lines across a piece of paper as, you, uh, as you've memorized it. Uh, but if you continue to rehearse it more and more, you get to the point where it's so natural that you change words that feel more comfortable for you to say in a natural setting than what you've written down on the piece of paper. So really rehearsing it uh, as much as possible will uh, help you get really comfortable with it. Yeah, you, 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 once you've rehearsed it so well, you can actually depart from what, from what you, were, once you had memorized and come right back at will. Yeah, like I know for my presentation, I actually changed, I think, one line completely from what I wrote down, but the point was the same. So it, no one noticed that line was changed, except for me. And that goes back to the point, no one knows your work better than you. Like, remember that even if you're uncomfy presenting or a little bit nervous, like, you are the owner of your work. You know your stuff really well. And so if you happen to stumble or you're struggling, at the end of the day, this is your stuff and you communicate it how you feel is most important. So just remember that despite even feeling uncomfy or if presenting isn't your thing, that you still have a lot of authority and ownership over your work. Right, and um, if you do forget something and you do hesitate, don't draw attention to it by apologizing. You know, you could even backtrack. Let's say, for example, you're in the middle of a line and you forget what comes next. Why don't you prompt yourself by repeating what you had just said? We often repeat ourselves in normal, in normal uh, conversation. We come to a point we say something and then we repeat perhaps for emphasis. So if you don't draw attention to any stumbles that you've had, it may never be noticed. Anyway, control your movements, use positive hand gestures and be authentic above everything. Don't, don't, uh, don't be fake. If it's worth saying, say it clearly, okay? 
don't swallow words, don't whisper. I, I know it's really, really tough and I feel exactly the same. If I'm sitting in the audience and I have, and I have to ask a question, I'm often several dB too low when I'm asking a question. It's, it's normal. But at any rate, when you're giving the presentation, don't swallow words, don't whisper. So you want to be able to communicate your expertise, indicate citations, and you know your commitment to the long haul. Nobody wants to hear or nobody wants to feel that this is just uh, that, that, that you're going to abandon this subject as soon as you've finished your thesis or the presentation or whatever. You want to make, give the impression at least that you're really looking at this for the long haul, that the subject that you're doing is so important to you that you intend to follow this up and indicate setbacks. We very rarely indicate setbacks. Even some of the best speakers don't indicate setbacks. There's nothing wrong with setbacks. Setbacks is part of life and part of drama. Things that went wrong, things that went wrong often help other scientists not make the same mistake again. So, so indicating setbacks and indicate your vision, your humanity, your passion and so on. So you want to, you want to uh, set the uh, curiosity of the audience on fire if you can. Fire them up. Um, engage with their experiences, their needs, their own setbacks, their own desires and so on. Now, in general, when you are asked to do a presentation, this could be a thesis defense, this could be a presentation in a conference, it could be a presentation like this, you know, be there early and be there early for the competition. Can't you, for example, was there an hour early, an hour before anybody else came and she was already going up and down practicing in here before the judges came. I had to tell her to stop practicing when the judges rolled up. Um, be the first to arrive, check the equipment. I know it's somebody else's responsibility, but if the equipment fails, uh, you know, you're gonna be part, they will feel that you're partly to blame. Remove coats, bags, clutter. We try to do that. Clean black and white boards. And we are desperately trying to do that as well. Position flowers, art, banner, remove audience barriers. Unfortunately, this thing is anchored in. I, I can't remove it. If, if, I, if I could roll this thing out of the way, I would roll it out of the way. Yes, question. So Yeah, you know, the pre the, this is the, uh, the Wilson Hall, the new Wilson Hall. You should go there and take a look at it. It's a, it's, it's a very nice, very nice venue. It's a, it's, it's a raised stage. You're elevated. The, you're elevated, it's raised, it's very large. The, 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 there's a huge, uh, uh, huge screen behind you, but don't put down fine print still. You know, people at the back still need to see. It's a very large open space and you can roam around quite a lot on that stage. Now, the, the, an, an X will almost certainly be marked, but uh, that I, you just, I would, don't pay attention to that. Yeah? I think I also heard a rumor that we're not having microphones. No microphones? I don't think so. I think they said the acoustics is I think there is a, there is a, yeah, yeah, you don't, that's correct. You may, you may not, you may be mic'd, if you, you may be mic'd for the vid, vid, videographer. But like here, we, we're not, you, we're not, uh, it, 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 the, the acoustics are very good in that room. So uh, if it's fake, if it feels contrived, contrived, avoid it. You, you want to look natural. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to look fake or contrived. If there is a microphone available, as someone who's like a very loud voice to begin with, oh, shame, sorry, Greg. As someone who's a very loud voice to begin with, I still would suggest always using a mic when you can because you don't know who is in the audience and you don't know people's different capacities to hear. So if you can use a microphone, I would suggest it. But if they don't, hopefully the acoustics are good enough. That's just my like plug on s hopefully one day accessibility light. Anyway, um, we're coming to the end as you can see. Another list of acknowledgements here uh, if you haven't seen them at the beginning. Uh, a lot of people have worked with me. I've worked with an awful lot of people. Uh, so thank you very much. I think this was a great, great event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.